or very short. Ours will be two. We have, we're going to go in the order of Bob, Richard, Keith, Peggy. So first we'll have Bob Gordon from Yale, then Keith Whittington from Princeton, then Richard Primus from Michigan, and Peggy Cooper Davis from NYU. Okay, Bob. Uh, okay, so I want to I wanna talk about a particular aspect of the problem of <coughs> of uh, uh, interpretation um, and uh, some of the varieties of historical argument that have been developed to deal with that. And the aspect I want to talk about is uh, is that of 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 trying to deal with the uh, with the ugly or archaic or obsolescent. Uh, past. The lawyers, even more than most people, need the past, um, a consciousness of history and its texts and traditions. But because of this, they need also more than most people to find ways to escape the past selectively, uh, to bury it or to forget it, or turn the nastier aspects of it into nostalgic haze or romance. The rhetoric of law is the fidelity of rhetoric of fidelity to and continuity with past authority, as we've been learning. This morning, <coughs> we may admire forward-looking legislatures and creative judges, but even they are expected to maintain continuity with the essentials, the basic text, the key precedents, the grounding principles, but the past is also a land of swamps, snares, and mines. Relying too much on it for guidance is dangerous, as persuasive in our legal tradition as the rhetoric of continuity and fidelity is the rhetoric of warnings against being mired in the past. Blind obedience to older laws and traditions leads to stagnation, anachronism, perpetuation or revival of obsolete and barbaric norms and practices. The most literally faithful applications of old text to modern context in which social uh, <coughs> circumstances, um, legal and political institutions, cultural practices and values the, uh, have changed utterly would have grotesque consequences, even the most diehard originalists. The, uh, have to admit that we could not now countenance interpretations of the Constitution prohibited the federal government from issuing paper money or financing an interstate road system, or that tolerated flogging, branding, and ear cropping as routine punishments, or supposed that the free speech clause was perfectly consistent with prosecutions for seditious libel, and the non-establishment of religion clause with state taxation for the compulsory support of Protestant churches, and with legislated disabilities for Catholics, Jews, and and Muslims. The, my late colleague Boris Victor has a wonderful article on the original understanding, which he simply catalogs all of the institutions of government that would have to be dismantled in order to make room for an original uh, <coughs> an interpretation of the Constitution that stressed original applications, uh, to be careful uh, about phrasing here. So if legal interpreters need narratives of continuity and fidelity uh, that bring the past to the present, they also need narratives of change refurbishing, modernization, even transcendence that shuck the skin of the dead past and leave the radioactive traces of it safely behind. Uh, <coughs> the, <coughs> excuse me, um, the, uh, 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 we need the history in order to have an identity uh, at all, but uh, we also need, um, as Nietzsche says, another mode that of critical history, the some way of, um, the uh, uh, some way of, um, the, uh, uh, as he says, to employ the strength to shatter and dissolve the past by bringing the past before a tribunal, painstakingly interrogating it, and finally condemning it. Now, just asserting continuity of principles and fidelity to textual meanings, the unchanging constitution, leads either to unresolvable difficulties, it seems to me, or deceptive practices or outright fabrication or myth-making. You end up simply have, having to invent a past tradition or a tradition or practice that matches up to what you want to find in the present. The, uh, <coughs> I have a long list of favorites here, but one of my absolute favorites is Justice Scalia's recent construction in the Ten Commandments cases, McCreary, of a syncretic traditional public religion, and a monotheistic consensus of Christian Jews and Muslims, or at least of those who believe in an anthropomorphic God who personally intervenes in human affairs, a public religion which seems simultaneously much too liberal for the period it is supposedly rooted in, and also too restrictive since it would leave out all the deistic founders, which is a pretty impressive group. The, uh, more subtly, there's Mike McConnell's ingenious effort to discover an originalist history of the 14th Amendment that would justify uh, Brown. A long history of departures from the reading you favor has to be written off as mistakes. Thus, in their confirmation hearings, for example, Roberts and Alito both suggested the court simply misread the 14th Amendment in Plessy v. Ferguson. The, uh, 
an opinion which was in his time so unexceptionable that most papers didn't even report on it. The, a misreading corrected by return to original principle in, in Brown. Now, the various ways out, as people have been discussing, the, uh, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> if you really want to follow this, you have to reject a lot of decisions that most people now accept. And the, other, and the various ways out are resort to, as people have been saying, abstraction at a, very, at a fairly high level to separate the original principle from its original applications and generalize it broadly enough to find the parallel between what the founding generation understood and what you want to do. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, Justice Brennan used to do this with property. Richard Epstein, for example, the, uh, does it with the, uh, with the takings clause. Uh, the, uh, but the problem for a strict originalist and traditionalist is if you don't make moves of this sort, you are, you are risking being chained to an illiberal past from which if legislatures persist the, uh, in uh, ratifying it, there is no escape hatch but, but Article 5. And this need to destroy or forget turns out to be just as urgent for lovers of continuity and tradition because among our most powerful and inspiring traditions are those of anti-traditionalist radicalism or anti-legalist legalism. The examples of the people out of doors mobilizing to alter and abolish their form of government or resisting legal enactments in the names of the higher laws of nature or of conscience, uh, or as my colleague Bruce Ackerman likes to emphasize, a history of the extra-legal construction of new constitutional foundations, which drive the novel system through, as at the original revolution, the adoption of the Civil War amendments, by force and fiat, and leave it to time and popular support to ratify and provide legitimacy. Now, lawyers generally constrained to interpret these episodes to smooth over the discontinuities. 19th century lawyers like Daniel Webster, for example, retelling the story of our constitutional founding, told it as if the revolution had hardly even happened, or it only happened to repair a momentary lapse on the part of the British imperial government from attention to the gradual unfolding of constitutional protections of liberty and and property. <clears throat> the leaders of Plymouth, he, James Downey said, were Englishmen, leaving oppression and misrule, but bringing all the bloods and blossoms and fruits of civil and religious liberty at that time to be had. They had close and controlling colonial feelings, but they also had English feelings, learning, taste, literatures, and prejudice. Where the form of government was already well enough, they let it alone. Where necessary, they reformed it. Everywhere and in all things, they acted in a true conservative spirit. Uh, <clears throat> meaning that extra legal acts of that been, might have been justified then as emergency repair be uh, measures could hardly be justified now. So lawyers need narratives to link the present to the past so as to appear to preserve continuity while critically interrogating or sometimes just denying or forgetting or leaving safely behind its ugliness, injustice, and terror. So the narratives are often implicit. Sometimes they appear as stories in judicial opinions or briefs or legislative debates just as often as background assumptions. Uh, and uh, I think the, uh, there, there, there are three standard types of such narratives, narratives of recovery or restoration, narratives of progress, and narratives of teleology. The narrative of recovery or restoration, often accompanied by a Jeremiah lamenting recent lapses and corruptions, is one in which the legal system is seen as ready to be guided to recover the purity of its original forms. The, uh, these may be as originalists would have it, the original applications of texts, or more broadly, original principles or settled traditions, or more broadly still, the brooding or guiding spirit of the founders or of their golden age. The, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, um, the party of continuity contains both people who would return to original meaning simply because they are authoritative and law to be law must be unchanging, and those who think they crystallize the great common law principles of liberty or the wisdom of the founders and must be maintained against the temptations posed by emergency or mere expediency against their repeal. People have cited here Sutherland's dissent in Blaisdell, the, uh, the, uh, which I recently reread, and find that among other things it contains the apian to the Tawney's opinion in Ex Parte Milligan and to the great and ancient red habeas corpus, which must, uh, as a stable constitutional, which must not be abridged even in times of emergency. Uh, that seems to be a notion of stability the, uh, that has a little more appeal now than it did to the lawyers of the New Deal. Um, <clears throat> these days, as I've argued elsewhere, conservative public rhetoric has migrated towards a much hazier kind of restoration, a sort of nostalgic reverie for a more virtuous society before the New Deal, the Warren Court, the Cultural Revolution of the 60s, and liberal public rhetoric similarly to nostalgia for the glory days of the rights revolution, um, to some extent the classical Republican tradition of self-rule, Frank wrote in this vein for a while, um, or for the restoration of some of the more inspiring radical traditions uh, in our 
in our history. Now, a narrative of progress or Whig history, which I think is the dominant form, is one in which law is seen as obeying a long-term process of historical transformation. For example, from feudalism to liberal capitalism, status to contract, hierarchy to equal rights, irrational to rational modes of proof, formal rules to functional rules, full legal rights for the privileged few to equal rights for all. Uh, there are innumerable examples uh, of this. Um, you find, for example, in JEB and, uh, and Alabama, the peremptory challenges of women jurors case, or Justice Thurgood Marshall's opinion in Bakke, a long melancholy history of injustices which are, we are only beginning to overcome and which the present case gives us an opportunity to make progress. The, um, the, uh, and finally, a teleological or promissory narrative is one in which shows legal forms working themselves pure over time to reveal their essence of imminent principle. Of course, there are also dynamic narratives of decline, the corruption and decline of republics, the fall of empires, but in our optimistic nation, these have remained until recently muted and minor. Themes. Now, the revolutionary lawyers argued their cause for independence from Great Britain in, a domin in, in, the, in the restorationist mode, that they were asserting the common law rights of freeborn Englishmen under the ancient Gothic constitution, which had been corrupted by the tyrannical practices of church and state. Uh, but they shared with other Englishmen a dynamic view of English political history, according to which these ancient liberties had been gradually recovered over centuries of struggle and finally confirmed in the constitutional settlement of 1689. The 19th century's dominant narrative was and still remained not nostalgic but dynamic and progressive, the story of the hand-in-hand -hand progress of, of commerce and liberty. Uh, <clears throat> and the ancien regime and its incidents, primogeniture, established churches, seditious libel, imprisonment for debt, hostility to bankruptcy, customary monopolies, prosecutions of labor unions as critical, criminal conspiracies, married women's disabilities, indentured servitude, eventually even slavery itself, and after slavery legally mandated uh, Segregation gradually disappear under the modernizing pressures of commercial, political, and scientific development. More and more groups shed special incidents of status and become eligible to participate as legal equals. <clears throat> now, in the classical period of legal liberalism, the arguments that the new 13th and 14th Amendments were designed to emancipate business enterprises also relied on a historical narrative according to which the common law had for centuries been working itself free of the twin evils of slavery and state-imposed monopolies both interferences with the right of freedmen to choose their, their, their vocations. This was a dynamic narrative of historical evolution, not a static one of adherence to unchanging law. I think the, the only way I would qualify what Howard Gilman was talking about this morning is that I think he's absolutely right to say that the unchanging constitution was the one to which 19th century lawyers swore formal fealty. The, but in fact, they accompanied that with a historical dynamic evolutionary transformation of the common law concepts the, on which the key notions of constitutional protections were based. So the classical lawyers developed the law of constitutional, of common law as a, as a, as a baseline of constitutional limitations, which relied on a, on a remarkably dynamic conception of evolutionary common law. Thomas Cooley, whom Howard quoted this morning, says, the, uh, <clears throat> The, uh, whatever in modern times has generally been looked upon as being outside of the sphere of legislation should be regarded as finally eliminated by from state authority, meaning by constitutional interpretations. To do this is only to take notice of the steady growth of free principles which have come from common law rules and usages and of their gradual expansion with the general advance of intelligence and independent thought and action among the people. The gradual transition from despotism to freedom has been mainly accomplished by the dropping out one by one of obnoxious and despotic powers and by recognition of the changes effected as permanent modifications of the constitutional, uh, of the constitutional system. And you can write a good deal, I think, of the history and constitutional law of, of private, both private and public law of the 19th century as a struggle between the lawyer's mission to preserve continuity with fundamental principles and con the faith of the founders and common law and constitutional vested rights and at the same time to ratify and rationalize the modernizing trends that were outdating the principles and upsetting the vested rights. So to do this, they sometimes told the story in a teleological mode as the gradual fulfillment of perfection of principles already embedded at the time of the founding. The, uh, <clears throat> this is Lincoln's great narrative, for example, of the development of freedom of equality. The, uh, <clears throat> but it was, um, it was, in a sense, indispensable for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the, for the purpose. Um, now, the, uh, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, property, to take an important example, and it's still indispensable, 200 years ago, 
included a man's right to his wife's exclusive domestic and sexual services, to the management of her assets and the dictation of her domicile, and to the labor of his children and apprentices, all protected by law against strangers who would appropriate and interfere with them, in fact, by state constitutions protecting vested rights. The legislature could not give married women independent rights to property, at least not give them the, uh, retroactively. It had to be perspective, perspective, if at all. 100 years ago, property had come expansively to include such rights as that of an investor in public utilities to a reasonable return on his investment, and an owner of business property to run it free of the interference of labor unions, all protected by constitutional law against legislative or administrative regulation that would infringe them. No lawyer or lay interpreter of the word property would take it to include any of these rights today. It's not just that property has new forms like derivatives and patent license undreamed of 217 years ago. Many of the old forms of property or expectations with respect to rights have disappeared. Similarly, one might think with something like cruel and unusual punishment. The founding generation had already revolted from English penal practice with its hundreds of death penalties, believing it to be barbarous and savage began to adopt a rehabilitative theory of imprisonment, the penitentiary, as the superior system that recommended itself to scientific minds. It seems hard to credit that they would have ruled out further moral development or scientific experiment that would lead future generations to think their own practices as primitive as they had found, as they had found the English one. Well, I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip over a lot of this stuff, though. Maybe we can return to this in, uh, in, 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 into, this, into this discussion. The, uh, <clears throat> The, I, I want to end by, by expressing you know, a little kind of qualified uneasiness the, uh, with, the continent, with, the, with, with, with the continuity, fidelity, the uh, originalist tradition. The, uh, because um, uh, even though, of course, strategically and rhetorically, I think that in order to be at all effective, either as a legal advocate or in political advocacy, one must to some extent identify with it. But I think one always has to identify with, with it, I think, as our ancestors did. The, uh, the revolutionary founders and the, uh, and, uh, and the 19th century lawyers and, and, the, and the New Deal lawyers being quite firm the, uh, on what it is about the, uh, <clears throat> um, our, uh, the, uh, our, our, our traditions and the histories, our, the legal traditions uh, and the political traditions that form our historical identity the, uh, are, 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 ser are, seriously, are seriously flawed. The, uh, <clears throat> <laughs> Excuse me. The, uh, the, the constitution that reflects who we are, our constituent identity as a people, the, uh, uh, contains many elements the, uh, that, the, uh, that we still the, uh, uh, have not worked out of our system and, uh, and I think need to work out of our system. The, uh, slavery was not an error in the original constitution, but integral to the entire scheme, in particular integral to the conception of liberty the, uh, and, uh, and, and, and property for the few. The, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the, the, aboli the abolition of slavery, the expansion of the franchise, the, uh, uh, the conferral of rights of organization on laborers, many things that we welcome, these were actually acts which changed, it seems to me, the constitutive nature of the American people rather than representing continuity. The, uh, the, <coughs> the, uh, some people, the, the Constitution that reflects who we are has room for somebody like Richard Posner who said, well, one of the things we are is we are people who tend to relax civil liberties in wartime. The, uh, <coughs> Roger Smith's great book, the, uh, On Equal Rights, which shows that a constitutive part of the American tradition is the notion that, the, uh, that, that rights really are not for everyone, that they are ascriptively the, uh, uh, given only to a few. We have to choose, it seems to me, the, uh, between, uh, between uh, our precedents, the, our public acts, the, our principles, the, uh, <clears throat> even people like Larry Kramer, who favor popular constitutionalism and the consulting of social movements, the, have been recently criticized, I think it seems to me quite rightly, for looking at some social movements and not at other social movements. There are some social movements that have produced just incredible ugliness in our history, and, uh, and, uh, and, we, want to, and we want to reject uh, uh, of them uh, as, uh, as, as, as well. So um, I'm totally in favor of, say, Marty Lederman's pro project that the function of history, in a sense, is to produce multiplicity. It's to spread out before us the varieties the, uh, of traditions, principles, precedents, the, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, heroic, and heroic predecessors that we have, but we still have the, uh, uh, what Holmes in one of his moments calls the problem of the sovereign act of choice, 
uh, and that means uh, uh, as much rejecting uh, some of these traditions as embracing them. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Sorry. I was moving right along because I was attentive to time. Mm. Richard. It's, it's always nice to get applause for the mere mention of my name. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. In, in thinking about the variety of this historical argument, there are a bunch of ways that you can cut, right? You can think about variety according to source. Um, you can think about varieties according to the sort of ends that the historical argument is supposed to advance. Right? There are some historical ar arguments in constitutional law, the virtue of which is supposed to be that uh, figuring out the right historical answer will vindicate democratic authority. And there are others where the, uh, the, the, what it's supposed to get you is the ability to constrain appropriate decision making. Um, there are others, the ones that I think uh, we're probably the best advised to pay attention to are the ones that in, in this in some ways But I want to focus on uh, a distinction between the group of historical arguments, the major value of which is to serve any of these ends, and a different way of understanding historical arguments, which is in terms of their social functions. Um, and the bottom line of my argument is going to be that we ought to do as much as we can when we think about historical arguments and constitutional and distinguish between uh, arguments that are there to serve ends, like respecting democratic authority or constraining decision making or giving a video, and arguments that are serving some of these other functions that I'm talking about. And that, as a general matter, we ought to prefer the historical arguments that support worthy ends well uh, than the ones that, uh, that, that support these so limiting functions. Um, and uh, now, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't be attentive to the functions. The functions are important parts of the structure, uh, but it might mean uh, that we ought to pay attention to them, uh, not in ways that guide, shape, and limit the decisions that we make. Um, so, there are a lot of untheorized historical arguments that sort of hang around constitutional law. They pick up your favorite contested set of, uh, of constitutional cases or, or law review articles or so forth. You will see a lot of stuff that says that historical argumentation is not always clear whether it's necessary or sufficient to get you from one place to another. The argument works well without them. Um, and part of what this suggests is that the functions of historical argument in constitutional law, not law are not only to advance a specified and clear set of ends, like respecting democratic authority and constraining decision making. Um, it, it's also the case, and I think importantly pointing out this direction, that many excellent arguments against the capacity of forms of historical argument, like Hache this morning, originalism, <coughs> to advance particular ends, uh, seem to have very little tendency to dissuade people from engaging in the, those styles of historical arguments. It is not new to note that the claim of originalism to vindicate democratic authority faces a large, large problem with the passage of time to dead hand. It is not new to note that the claim that originalism has the virtue of constraining authority faces a very serious problem that most of the time it doesn't seem to constrain authority very much, or at least not more so than, than any other uh, uh, contemporary theory that you might adduce. But these are not new observations, and not only are they not new, I, I, I think they're correct. I think, I think they're pretty clearly correct. But it is nonetheless the case uh, that the practice of originalism goes on anyway. Um, and so here I, I uh, I recall an anecdotal witness in the previous panel where the following two, uh, two, two positions are articulated. Right? On the one hand, we have Irwin, who says, we ought to focus on falsifying the claim that originalism constrains. And on the other hand, we have John, who says, we do need a new defense of originalism, right? because the old defenses of originalism are unsatisfactory. So I think about this and say, well, maybe we don't need a new defense of originalism because the old defenses are unsatisfactory. Maybe the fact that the old defenses are unsatisfactory means that we ought not to have originalism. 
So if the fact that the old defensive originals were unsatisfactory means that we need to come up with a new defensive originalism, it's likely, maybe, you ought to think about the fact that the reason for being an originalist doesn't lie in this new defense, right? It lies in something else. And then if the next defense proves unsatisfactory, right, there will be another defense generated after that, such that Erwin is I, maybe correct when he says that interpretive discretion is not much constrained by originalism. Though, note, that can't be totally true. It's also totally true that you have to choose between originalism and Brown. Those two things can't both be true at the same time. One thing has to be moderated over the other. But let's assume that it's, but, but if it's, but if we were to conclusively demonstrate Right, that originalism does not constrain all that well, I, I think we would be really foolish to assume that the next thing would happen is that people would say, oh, you're right, we have to now stop being originalists. Um, and what this all to, so one way to characterize this approach is to say the historical argument in constitutional law, originalism or otherwise, is valued not just as a method to support ends like interpretive constraints, democratic decision making, but as a practice, right, um, uh, in the social science sense. Uh, this is partly captured by the otherwise, unfortunately, ugly term modality, right? Uh, when we talk about a, a modality of argument in the way that somebody like Philip Bobbitt would want us to, part of what that means is that in engaging in this argument, we're not just doing the things that internal to the discourse we say we're doing by advancing the argument, but that the fact of engaging in the argument is a way of being in the conversation that supports the whole conversation and keeps it going, right? It, it, it's a, the basis of legitimacy value before its own practice. Now, that tells us some things, but it, it, it's ultimately unsatisfying, right? You're going to ask, you know, we now have to talk about, okay, so what turtles does that turtle stand on, right? Or another way of asking that question is, what are the functions of the practice that make it attractive, right? Such that we would, in fact, want to continue to engage in. So if the answer is historic, if the practice under investigation is historical argument in constitutional law, including but not limited to originalism, what are the functions, right, that make it attractive to practitioners? Um, so the first thing that I'll say is, um, and, 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 and I mean this first one quite seriously, though, I don't think it does all the work, is don't underestimate the sheer fun of it. Um, uh, it's fun for most people who engage in originalism to rummage in the archives and engage romantically with famous historical figures and imagine themselves you know, sitting in Philadelphia. And so forth. And, I mean, if you ask, uh, you know, if you ask people who do lots and lots and lots of originalism, you know, how do you feel when you're doing it? I think you rarely find people who say, yeah, this stuff doesn't speak to me at all. <laughs> right? It is a chore, right? But, you know, but you got to do it and you got to pay your taxes. Um, now, so I think that there, there's something just at that level that's attractive about the practice. And that, I think, is part of what keeps it going. Um, and then, at a deeper level, the practice of historical argument helps to legitimize the entire constitutional system through what we can call the discursive creation of an intertemporal constitutional community. Right? One of the big problems that people who think self-consciously about constitutional law face is, 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 is the problem of the fact that we all know that we weren't there when the thing was written. We all know that we weren't there when the thing was invented. Um, we have to find some ways of time. We all know the world is very different. There are nagging suspicions that we all entertain that we need to do some work to tie us to them in order to make sense of the process of continuing to tell them, the documents that they left us. Uh, <coughs> there might be reasons that we do that, right? And so constitutional uh, discourse, uh, by having within it a practice where we talk about the history as if it mattered, sets up a perpetual process in which we all signal to each other that it matters, right? That they matter. And if they matter, right, it must be because we are, in fact, meaningfully connected to them, or else we wouldn't be doing this, right? Now, is this circular? Yes. But it's circular, right, in the way that self-legitimating social practices are circular, right? We enter it, at, not even just as, as, as first-year law students, we enter it as children, you know, in, you know, in, in, in physics classes and before, right? We engage with the history in these ways. We learn to do it. We then show our membership in the community by making historical arguments. And we teach implicitly the next entrance in that we make these historical arguments. And each time we make them or hear them, we teach each other and ourselves that they matter, that these, that these arguments and these people matter to us. Um, it helps allay the anxiety, right? Um, uh, uh, one, one, and there are clear resonances here between the practice of 
there are arguments in constitutional law, and certain sorts of discursive ritual activities that take place in other institutions that have been remarkably successful over time in creating a sense of intertemporal community. Um, two that come to mind are the mass of the Catholic Church um, and the Jewish Passover Seder, right? I mean, I had a church student with Harold Gilman this morning, right, in which we arrive at the sentence, in every generation, the constitutional lawyer must look at himself as if he, too, sat in Philadelphia, right? Um, now, what is, now, it's not true, of course, that we sat in Philadelphia, right? But by thinking of ourselves that way, we collapse the difference between us and them, right? We imagine that we stand in, the, in their shoes, they stand in ours. And if we can talk ourselves into thinking that we are, that we are our predecessors, right, then we'll see the inherited constitutional system as our own. We will evaluate more sympathetically. Uh, we will not worry about things like the dead hand problem, uh, because after all, we are them, right? And there, 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 there is no dead hand. Now, yes, I am saying that these functions are at least in large part subconscious, right? Um, uh, Nobody ever says, or at least not that I'm aware of, right, in deciding a constitutional case, and rarely even in writing a law review article, something like, we must look to 1787 or 1868 so as to create the sense of connection without which our behavior would make no sense. Right? That's not what we say, and it's usually not how we understand what we're doing in the moment that we do it. And uh, so I, I am saying people often make, or all of us, me too, right, historical arguments um, that have certain ostensible ends within the discourse, like, uh, promoting interpretive, uh, uh, excuse me, confining interpretive discretion or respecting democratic authority or so forth. Um, but where the arguments are actually better understood is serving these other sorts of discursive functions of historical arguments that I'm talking about. Uh, if, it, if it occurred to you before I mentioned it that my account entailed uh, a claim that a fair amount of the operation of the practice is subconscious, you may have thought of that as a criticism of my view. Right? Don't sit there, Primus, and tell us Right, that the community of interpreters, including judges, law professors, other decision makers, don't know fully what they're doing. Um, but I actually don't think that this is a vice of my explanation. I, I think it's, it's, it's at least as plausibly a virtue. Um, that is, say, any complex, this is how complex social practices work, right? Complex social practices are not fully articulated and are not fully conscious. Um, uh, I, I, I know that I'm not always self conscious about the reasons for all my complex social actions. It seems to me unlikely that. Um, so, where does all this get me? What, in other words, what if I'm right about this characterization of, of, of the important functions of historical argument in constitutional law? Well, it means that the practice of historical arguments weights constitutional decision making toward some criteria rather than others, right? Toward status quo sorts of decision making, probably, or if not status quo decision making. Uh, than at least other sorts of things rooted in the past as opposed to various other sorts of things that would be legitimate inputs to constitutional decision making like the present concerns of things like social welfare or contemporary standards of justice or, or even present democratic choice. Um, now my own view is that the legitimating function of the historical argument is unnecessary uh, for legitimating the system. Right? I think that we have a constitutional system that is legitimate enough on other grounds um, without the need to, to tie it to an ancestry to which we owe fidelity. Um, and I also think that to whatever uh, extent the discourse succeeds in creating such identification, uh, and which might be thought as legitimacy enhancing, it does so only for uh, the, the very, very small rarefied group in the bubble. Um, which, uh, on, on, on which, uh, I, I regret to have to sit down to, to inform all about the legitimacy of the constitutional regime does not depend. Um, uh, it, as, as Barry said this morning, uh, the, to whatever extent the broader public cares about constitutional law, it cares at the level of results, not at the level of reasons, um, uh, certainly not at, at the level of precise theory. Um, uh, so in uh, so, what I would say is, right, taking from Barry and his invitation of Paul Brest, um, we might not, we might, we'd be well advised not to let the content of constitutional decision making be guided or limited by the historical arguments that exist to fulfill the discursive function of community creation, right? Brest is right 
about what constitutional interpretation should be. Constitutional interpretation should be an exercise, right, that says these are the best ends of the constitutional system. Now let us make the decisions that best advance those ends, right? Barry is right that we cannot turn, that, that we must think, though, about selling those decisions, right, in terms that are acceptable, persuasive to the audience that is there to make the purchase. Um, the question is, should the history help decide what it is that we choose to sell, right? And there I'm trying to say, well, maybe not, except to the extent that attention to history tells us things like what works in a given set of institutional arrangements, how are things likely to play out. Um, uh, that, I guess, is where I'll stop. Um, so I thought for the next few minutes, uh, focus on one particular uh, variety of uh, historical argument in, in constitution, American constitutionalism, which is uh, originalism. Um, uh, I'm on record as a defender of originalism um, and have written explications of what originalism uh, looks like and why it ought to be attractive. Although most of what I've uh, been working on more recently focuses on other aspects of uh, historical argumentation in, in American constitutional practice, ones that are focused more on, uh, my scholars at least, focus more on descriptive um, characterizations of how history has played into um, uh, uh, constitutional arguments, how it shapes constitutional practices, the ways in which we turn to history um, to provide examples and, and evidence about uh, uses and effects. Uh, rather than uh, the way we turn to it in the context of originalism and focused on uh, authority um, and, and sets of, of normative commitments. Um, but for now, I want to turn back to uh, thinking about the ways in which history uh, can serve that kind of normative purpose um, as, as a binding authority um, that, that we might uh, want to use. I think in that context, it's no accident um, that both for the uh, rise of modern originalism in the 1960s and 1970s um, and early uh, 1980s um, on the conservative side uh, and then uh, some of the recent work in what might characterize as progressive constitutionalism and the like um, of the type um, that Mark Lederman was talking about um, doing himself um, in this context. They're, they're primarily oriented toward criticizing governmental actions, whether for um, uh, the early conservative originalists in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, uh, the primary governmental actor uh, that they want to criticize are the courts, and that the courts have gotten it wrong uh, in various kinds of cases, and we're going to show you the history to demonstrate uh, the ways in which um, the court has, has made a dreadful error uh, in thinking about uh, what particular um, uh, constitutional claims uh, might, might be. That there's no way that one can justify uh, the kinds of actions that they're uh, undertaking uh, on the basis of, uh, of, of the historical materials about what these, these clauses actually mean. Likewise, then, we might criticize the Bush administration or other um, uh, current decisions uh, that might be made by other political actors on similar kinds of grounds, that there's no way in which this, these current sets of decisions that are being made can be reconciled with um, any kind of original understanding of, of, the, of the text. And this is, I think, um, a very useful service that originalist arguments and this kind of appeal to history uh, can perform within constitutional argumentation, which is this critical uh, service of being able to show um, that uh, at least some kinds of governmental practices um, are hard to reconcile uh, with uh, important claims about what the text uh, was, was intended to do in the first place, what the basic principles embodied in the constitutional um, uh, text were designed uh, to do in the first instance. But one of the significant things about that is that's mostly about providing outer boundaries um, for what uh, decisions governmental actors are doing. They're mostly aimed at showing that some particular decision is so far um, beyond the bounds of, ex of acceptable uh, constitutional choices um, that it can be easily criticized and, and can be identified as wrong uh, on the basis of, of that kind of historical evidence. What that leaves, though, within those outer boundaries is a lot of room for additional discretion, choice, and judgment um, about what uh, constitutional practices um, ought, to, ought to look like. Um, and so it can be, I think, misleading to uh, jump from uh, where it is that originalism is often most useful, which is saying some things are beyond the pale, um, to then generalizing from that uh, a more general assumption about what it is originalism can do 
um, in, in constitutional practice or in judicial argumentation. So, for example, for I think many of uh, the conservative originalists of the 70s and early 80s, uh, they moved from thinking originalism was a very useful way of critiquing certain decisions of the Warren Court or early Berger Court um, to a more general claim uh, that, that the value of originalism is it can constrain judicial discretion uh, and it will tie the hands of judges and point them in a particular direction. I think the kinds of critiques that have been mounted against that position um, are quite accurate. Um, that's not true, that originalism is, is uniquely useful or even potentially even any more useful uh, than a variety of other approaches to constitutional interpretation in terms of tying the hands of judges, pointing them in certain directions, 